Hey, everybody, welcome back. Let's check in with our friend John Baptiste. Hello, John. Hello. What's what's going on? What's the word? I I don't. I want to know what's going on with you because I know that on Saturday, you are going to be leading a a a, a march, uh, an, an yes. event, a happening yes. about justice. Where is it going to be, and 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 how can people learn about it? Oh my goodness. Well, go on Instagram, John Baptiste, and you'll see it there. It's going to start in Union Square at 1 p.m., and we're going to march, and we're going to celebrate and sing songs of love and freedom, and um, I think it's going to be very, very impactful, so please join us. I am so happy to hear that, John. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, I think you, you have the spirit of love and inclusiveness and uh, joy that... Um, is going to be so meaningful to people this weekend, and I hope a lot of people show up. Be careful, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got to be careful out there. Peaceful but... march. Peaceful yeah, it's march. Peace, it's peaceful. We, we, we are peaceful, but we mean business. So we, we're the business of peace. <laughs> well, John, would you, you got anything you could play for us as we, as we go out into the weekend here? Maybe oh, a little yeah, something you yeah. might be playing tomorrow? Oh, my goodness. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Gonna keep on marching, keep on marching, marching on the freedom lane. It's not gonna get better than that. Thank yes, you, John. Yes, Have a good weekend. You too. Have a good one. My first guest tonight has been a congresswoman since 2011. She's currently the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus and leading the House legislative strategy on justice for black Americans. Please welcome Congresswoman Karen Bass. Congresswoman, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on. Now, I understand uh, as chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, you just entered a virtual town hall called Living While Black in America. Who, who are the, some of the voices you were hearing from today? Well, lots of people who were involved in different community activities, period, but especially right now because of what we're facing. And people were just in general expressing their anguish and their fatigue. How long, how long, how long, how many people have to be killed on video? What, what, is, what needs to happen now legislatively? What do you as a congresswoman, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, the, the Democrats, and those allies you can find in the Republican Caucus who sort of see the inflection point we're at right now? Um, I know that Speaker Pelosi has asked you to lead the, the action um, that's going to be taken to investigate what can be done right now. What are your plans in the short term? Sure. Well, on Monday, we will be having a press conference unveiling a bill that we will introduce simultaneously in the House and the Senate. And basically, the bill covers several areas. But let me just put it this way. It is so difficult when you find an officer that has been problematic, excessive force, numerous complaints. It's difficult to fire the individual, prosecute the individual, or sue the individual. And so laws need to be changed to allow officers to be accountable. Then there needs to be legislation that uh, increases transparency. So for example, with uh, the officer that killed George Floyd, he was fired. If he had not been arrested, he could have easily moved to another town and been hired as a police officer. And so coming from the perspective of any profession, I don't care what profession it is, yours, mine, none of us want to have bad apples in our profession that soil the name of the profession that we're in. And so wanting to give police departments tools so that they can fire an officer and then they can know whether that officer is going to another town. So a national database of officers that are problematic. So if, if a, say, the officer who killed George Floyd, if he'd gone to another town, there would be no call to the previous police department he'd worked for? They would not say? that he had been fired for cause okay, in the what? unlawful death of someone? They could, but maybe not. So for example, do you remember the 12 year old child that was killed, Tamir Rice, he was yeah. playing with a gun and he the officer him, yeah. within 60 seconds shot him and killed him. 
that officer had been fired a few months earlier by another department. So you know how it is when you hire somebody, maybe they tell you on a reference, maybe they don't. Maybe you do due diligence, maybe you don't. So part of the due diligence would be a lot easier if there was a national database, just like there is. I mean, in the medical profession, the legal profession, this is not a new idea, but police officers are essentially shielded from that. And if you have an officer that has repeatedly been involved in officer-involved shootings or numerous complaints, then we need to do something to intervene. And right now, it's very difficult to do that. Has the police union been helpful in this? Do they understand that something needs to change? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we, our outreach will begin. So far, the interactions have been generally positive. Now, we will see when the bill is revealed, you know, before we were just talking conceptually, but when uh, police unions see the bill, when it's introduced on Monday, then that's when, when we will see. But I have reason to believe that there is an openness right now. I mean, you have seen across the country, you've seen police officers kneeling, taking a knee. You've seen them marching along with protesters. Now you've seen some bad things too, but I do think that we are at a, a moment of an inflection point in our country. And I am very, very hopeful that in, that involves police officers too. Several police chiefs after they saw that horrific video said that if anybody in my department thinks that that was okay, they need to turn in their badge. That's the kind of leadership we need right now. What, what do you think of the actions uh, in Los Angeles about removing $150 million in the budget for the police department and putting that money instead into or, uh, organizations and entities that could provide the social services that are too often put on police um, and the police don't want to do themselves? Well, uh, and shouldn't. I mean, I think that that's absolutely right. As a matter of fact, in Los Angeles, we have some successful models of community-based policing, of working where a police officer will go hand in hand with another professional, like a social worker. So we do have uh, examples here where we have been able to reduce crime without just mass arrests or abusing citizens. But, you know, part of it is a cultural change. And so struggling to get the police department to change their culture, like for example, I represent a district in Los Angeles where part of my district is wealthy and it's white. The other part of my district is South Central Los Angeles, the inner city that's African American and Latino. Police officers approach those sides of town completely different. When it comes to the affluent side of town, they're there to protect and serve. When it comes to South Central Los Angeles, a lot of times they go in with a warrior mentality. Everybody in the community is seen as problematic. And many police officers have told me that they have to deal with rookie officers when they're getting out of the police academy saying, yeah, I want my first assignment to be South Central so I could go down there and kick some butt. Now, if that's your view of the community, then why would you be surprised that officers would get into trouble and that communities would feel that they are not respected? Um, a lot of the motivation for protesters right now, specifically around George Floyd, um, and uh, whose memorial was, was just yesterday in Minneapolis, I want to talk about Breonna Taylor for a moment because today would have been her 27th birthday. She was killed during an entry on a no-knock warrant. And I understand you want to take some action on that. What is it about that case that you think can be addressed legislatively? Well, oh, well, no-knock warrants can be banned, just like chokeholds can be banned, you know, in terms of George Floyd. So, you know, in that, in that situation, you had them just go into the home unannounced, and her boyfriend was defending himself. I mean, Second Amendment rights, right? He was defending himself. You remember, he was the one that got arrested. He's calling 911 saying that somebody has just invaded my house. And so it is not, it is not that unusual that the police department could make a mistake. But if you make a mistake like that, it can obviously have deadly results. Um, you've met with a bipartisan, uh, it's called the Problem Solvers Caucus. Yes. Are you feeling any support from GOP representatives right now who, who's, as I was saying before, have to have some sense that this is um, we're at a turning point right now? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was a very interesting call, and I'm going to repeat the call next week because when I called them the other day, we did not have the legislation ready. We were just talking conceptual, but um, there was interest. There was support. As a matter of fact, one of my former colleagues, I mean, one of my colleagues I didn't know was a former police officer. Another one of my colleagues, his son was a police officer. So they certainly seemed to uh, be understanding. They were absolutely appalled at the video. They didn't understand why chokehold should be a procedure that is used. So I found that there was a lot of interest. There seemed to be a lot of support, but we have, we have to see what happens when the rubber hits the road, which means it's time to vote. What would you say, if you could, to the president who tweeted a letter today that said those protesters in Lafayette Square weren't real? Well, I mean, honest, someone asked me what I thought he should say to the nation, and I, I frankly uh, said nothing. He should say nothing. Uh, what would I have to say to him? I mean, I, I don't even know at this point. Other than that, it's another lie. If we had to add him up, I'm sure it's twenty or 30,000 by this point. Well, Congresswoman, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me on. Congresswoman Karen Bass, everybody. We'll be right back with CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin. Thank you, ma'am.